The volume of presidential mail today can be enormous. One of these presidents made it a habit of reading 10 letters every night before going to bed. Take a look at them. Who do you think it is? This woman may have had the greatest impact on a president during her lifetime just simply from her letter writing. She referred to herself as the president's little dwarf. I'll tell you more about her remarkable story and her activism and the impact that she had on an American president in this edition of Prez Politics. Less than four months into his term, James Garfield was shot in 1881 by a deranged gunman while entering a train station in Washington, D.C. That assassin was named Charles Guiteau. He was a disgruntled office seeker. The vice president, Chester Arthur, at this time, is staying out of the spotlight. He is laying low. He is not visible in public. He's reading the public updates of the president's condition like everybody else. But he's also reading a lot of speculation in the press about a possible Arthur presidency, should something happen to Garfield and Garfield die. The Chicago Tribune had their doubts. The New York Times said that Arthur was about the last man eligible to become president. And then on top of that, Arthur is reading these stories that are being spun that perhaps he was a part of a conspiracy with Charles Guiteau to get Garfield out of office. Garfield, who was a standing for political reform, so that Arthur could become president. Now you have to understand Arthur's backstory. In 1871, Arthur was appointed by President Grant to the position of collector of the Port of New York. This is a very powerful position. It was a patronage appointment. Uh, that port in New York uh, took in about 75% of the nation's custom receipts came through that port. And this position was historically ripe for corruption. The customs house in New York uh, was used to enrich the New York Republican political machine led by Senator Roscoe Conkling. And so Arthur serves in this position. And so he appears to be a loyal party man. He appears to be a loyal follower of Roscoe Conkling. And Arthur really is guilty by, associate, by association. He's never been charged with bribery or payoffs. But the perception is if Arthur becomes president, Roscoe Conkling will be behind the scenes. He could be the puppet master. He'll be the man behind the power. Arthur will appoint a bunch of Conkling men to his cabinet and get rid of Garfield's uh, cabinet that's already in place. Can you imagine Arthur's state of mind during this time period while Garfield is suffering and we don't know whether or not he'll live or die? Arthur is reading that he's unfit and unprepared to be president. He's reading that he's corrupt, and they're talking about his associations from New York state politics. He's also reading that he could possibly be part of a conspiracy to take Garfield out. You can imagine that this would have some sort of a psychological effect on his state of mind. In fact, I would say his confidence is probably shaken at this time. While the country focuses on Garfield's condition at this time, and there, there's all this speculation about a possible Arthur presidency, Chester Arthur receives a two-page letter from a woman that he doesn't know and he's never met. Her name was Julia Sand. She was 31 years of age. She was single. She had never been married. She lived, uh, she was really homebound because of some of her illnesses. She was a voracious reader of newspapers. She picked up every bit of political gossip. She knew every issue. She knew political feuding that was going on. She was very well versed in politics. And she, she certainly knew the issues of the day. But she writes this two-page letter to Arthur. She really doesn't mince words. She's very familiar in the way that she writes. It's almost as if she, she knows Arthur. And she's very direct. And you take a look at this quote from that letter. She basically starts off by pointing out, you know, when Garfield was shot, a lot of us thought you might have had something to do with that. You take a look at this quote. She says, are you content to sit like a snake charmer and let lonesome serpents coil about you, priding yourself on it that not one of them dare sting you? One month after receiving this letter from Julia Sand, 
Arthur received news that Garfield had died some 80 days after being shot. And then Arthur be became the 21st president of the United States. You know, we know that during this time period, Julia Sand wrote Chester Arthur about 23 letters total. And he's, she's very politically astute. She gives some great advice and some of this advice he takes. For instance, she says, listen, let the nation mourn Garfield. Don't give any political appointments. Don't push for political appointments. Timing is everything. And that certainly is true in politics. She said, stay away from New York state politics. The appearance and the reminder of your past associations. Uh, she said, don't take any advice from President Grant. Uh, she said, if you want to keep him around to smoke cigar, cigars with, that's fine, but don't take any of his political advice. You know, Julia Sand called herself the president's little dwarf. She sort of likened herself to a dwarf or a court jester in a royal king's court. You know, they were the ones that oftentimes could speak truth to the king. A lot of times it would be sort of sandwiched in and couched with humor, but they usually had a lot of leeway when other people in the king's royal court didn't. You know, one year after she's writing these letters, on August the 20th of 1882, Chester Arthur, President Arthur, shows up unannounced at Julia Sands' house. He's curious, he wants to meet this woman who's writing him. It was a little awkward for Julia, we're told. She's caught by surprise, she's not prepared, but it was a memorable trip. And what we know is, later on, Arthur comes out and says he's for civil service reform. And if they pass something in the Congress, he's gonna sign it. And we know that in 1883, he signs the historic Pendleton Act, which really helps clean up this spoil system, this political patronage. Uh, jobs would then be merit-based. Uh, in many cases, there would be examinations that would be required to, to really assure us that someone has competence to take that government job. And so it was really a good first step for Arthur, and he boldly comes out and surprises everybody by signing it. In 1884, the Republican Party passed up renominating him. Uh, Arthur was the fifth setting president to be denied renomination from their own party. And a little over uh, a year and a half after leaving office, Arthur died in New York City from Bright's disease. He was just 57 years of age. The day before he died, he asked his son to burn some of his private and public papers. And perhaps this is a way of trying to erase parts of his political past. But the letters that Julius Sand had sent him, those letters were preserved. Did he cherish her advice? I would say yes. Did he think that they needed to be left for history's sake? Yes, I think so. I think he respected and he certainly cherished Julius Sand, his pen pal, uh, during this time. Uh, one person, but one person I think made a difference. Presidential leadership, two lessons I think we can take from this. Number one, presidents need to regularly hear from the American people. It can be so easy to be stuck in the White House bubble or that Washington DC bubble that you cannot relate with voters who people who voted for you. And whether or not that's reading letters, reading emails, touring different parts of the country, talking with average Americans to keep yourself grounded. You know, we know that Eleanor Roosevelt um, oftentimes was the eyes and ears for Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression. President Obama, every night when he went to bed, uh, was given a briefing book, a three ring binder briefing book. And inside that briefing book was a, a thin purple envelope. And in that purple envelope were 10 letters from average Americans who were just detailing the issues and the things that they were going through at the time. And this was something that President Obama insisted be given to him every night. It was something that he enjoyed reading. Uh, he was averaging about 5,000 letters roughly a day at the time. And he had staffers and volunteers go through those and weed out and select 10 that he read every night, which I think was a great idea really for any president to do. I think to keep them grounded and let them see really what other parts of the country is experiencing. 
I think the second lesson from this account, this story, is that presidents need people around them to speak truth, that don't just tell them what they want to hear, but tell them what they need to hear. And in this case, you have Julia Sand, who I think in some ways made a difference. We don't have any evidence that Arthur ever wrote her back. We know that he visited her. Uh, he had been reading her letters. Uh, we do know that he did come out and, and shock all the political pundits and all of the people during the day when he signed this Pendleton Act into law, pushing for political reform and trying to clean up uh, this game of political patronage. It was a brave first step uh, in political patronage reform, and Arthur took it. What do you think is the single biggest issue when it comes to political reform in our country today? If you were to narrow it down to just one issue, one topic that you think the president or members of Congress should focus on, what is it? I would really be curious just to see what you think. Post your comments and your opinions in the section below.